Hello and welcome to today's Genetics and Multiomics in Medicine MSc Virtual Open Day. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is India Dean Smith. I am an MBBS student at UCL and your chair this afternoon. We hope this session will address those core specific questions that you may have and will help you to gain an insight into what it is really like to study on one of our master's programs. I am delighted to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Horia Stanescu, who will provide you with a summary of our genetics and multiomics in medicine program. And there will be a Q&A session for the second part of the event. This session is being recorded and will be made available on our website following today's event. Now to introduce our speaker. Dr. Horia Stanescu is a specialist in medical genetics with more than 20 years of international experience in biomedical research. Having spent four years at the National Human Genome Research Institute in the USA, he joined the University College London in 2007, where he is currently a lecturer in renal genetics and a primary PhD supervisor at the Faculty of Medical Sciences. Over to you, Dr. Stanescu. Thank you very much, India. Good afternoon. Um, I will start by sharing my screen. Just a second. Does this work? Yep, can see okay. the slides. Thank you very much. I'm. Uh, my name is Horia Stanescu, and uh, I'll uh, tell you uh, the story of uh, genetics and multiomics in medicine. We initiated this program uh, officially three years ago, but content-wise, we started long before. Um, the core of the program were a series of informal research seminars, which we held at our group, which is the genetics and genomics group within the UCL Division of Medicine. And these seminars turned out to be popular, so we decided to officialize them. And uh, I'll give you a short presentation trying to define some of the terms that are related to the course, to the program. And in the process, hopefully, we'll get a feeling about what, how, and uh, why we are doing what we aim to be doing. I will start with a quote by Walter Cannon, because this is uh, the Genetics and Multiomics in Medicine program. And the quote suggests that a profound understanding of the workings of the human organism is a prerequisite to our ability to use medicine as a force for good. The wisdom of the body, in uh, Walter Cannon's wor words, is of course a poetic way to refer to a very important biological concept which was coined by Cannon, and this concept is homeostasis. Um, homeostasis is the mechanism by which the organism maintains its stability, its equilibrium. And this implies that alterations to the equilibrium will lead to disease. So in the context of medicine, of the biomedical sciences, we are driven by the quest to understand how diseases originate, if we are to better, to, to better diagnose them and hopefully eventually better treat them. So pathogenesis is the science which studies the origin and the development on, of diseases. And the etymology of the word is of uh, Greek origin, comes from pathos, which is the area of uh, medicine, passion, suffering, pain, and um, genesis. Genesis in Greek also relates to heredity, and this gives the name to genetics. Genetics is usually defined as being a science of heredity, and biological heredity is a very interesting concept. It combines two apparently antagonistic notions, constancy and variability. I'm going to illustrate um, with a coral reef, the beautiful variability of the living world. 
And if we're looking at the coral reef, we also underlie the need for constancy, the need for a constant environment in which corals survive, but also intrinsic constancy of the components of uh, the reef for its survival. And if we're looking at such a complex system, if we want to analyze it, we better decompose it in simpler elements. One of the elements of the reef, in this case, this is the red coral. And its shape, it's suggestive for the way that the tree of life is usually represented since Darwin. But you never heard of the coral of life. You might have heard of the tree of life. And Darwin used the tree metaphor because this captures some salient points about the architecture of the network of life. The network of life is complex and um, one of the most important characteristic is the flow of information. And this flow is represented by the branches which generate ever growing complexity. Now, if we're talking about information in the context of biology, the information of life is genetic information. And genetic information is captured, its material substrate is a class of molecules that are at the core of biology. They are called semantides, and they are going to be at the core of our program as well. They are going to be the main object of the study during the one-year master's course. The relationship between semantides is known somehow tongue-in-cheek as being the central dogma of molecular biology. And the central dogma was first presented by Francis Crick um, in a seminar, at a seminar that took place at UCL. Francis Crick is very famous for his discovery of the structure of DNA, together with uh, James Watson, the model, the Crick-Watson model and Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins as well. It is less known that, Maurice, that uh, Francis Crick started his studies at UCL and then even embarked on a PhD uh, program, but uh, his PhD was interrupted by the onset of World War II. Back to the semantides and the interplay between them, this interplay ultimately expresses, or so to say, brings to light the complex biological organism. And uh, when I say bring to light, this is to introduce the concept of finine, which literally in Greek means to bring to light. And finine is the root of phenotype, which is the way the, which is the appearance of the individual. Then also phenome, which is the complete representation of the phenotype of one given species. And phenomics is the science of investigating the phenome. Now we said that uh, phenomics brings to light the organism. So I'm going to show you this uh, beautiful painting of a master of light. Of um, This is Rembrandt van Rijn's uh, painting called The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Nicolas Taupe. And in this painting, Rembrandt also brought the body to light, so to say. Now, as for um, Rembrandt and for Dr. Taupe in the 17th century, the human body is our main object of interest as biomedical researchers in this 21st century. I would like to draw your attention to how Dr. Talp is using his hands, his hand in the process of dissecting, dissection. So he is dissecting, he is analyzing. He brings to light trying to understand the structure of the organism. We might consider that this is a painting of hands dissecting hands. And in the same vein, we can look at this drawing of hands drawing hands. And this is a drawing by another Dutch artist, Moritz Cornelius Escher. And I like this drawing because 
it suggests one of the aspects why the human body is such a fascinating object to us. Because at the same time, it is our object of study and it is our instrument of research. We are using our hands, we are using our brains to understand it. Mentioning instruments of research, they have far expanded since the days of the early anatomists. This is an aspect of the phenotype. And this is paradoxical because in this case, bringing to light literally means the use of invisible radiation to make structures visible. What you see in this, uh, in this slide is one of the first X-ray images depicting the bones of the hand of Konrad Röntgen's uh, spouse. X-rays were also used to dive even deeper in the structure of the living organisms, down to the infrastructure, to the molecular level. What I'm showing here is the famous X-ray diffraction picture 51. And this is the picture that was taken by Rosalind Franklin in Maurice Wilkins laboratory. And this is the picture which led to the elucidation of the structure of DNA in 1953. 50 years later, because of the elucidation of the structure of DNA, it became possible to read for the first time the entire genetic information of a human organism. And that is thanks to the Human Genome Project. In the course of our program, we are extensively discussing the Human Genome Project and its results and the way it changed our approach to studying biology. The classical way of studying biology was one gene at the time approach. So this was the serial approach. And this is classical genetics. But now we have access, as I mentioned, to the entire genome, roughly 20,000 genes, which can be studied in parallel thanks to modern high throughput sequencing technologies, which are going to be also extensively discussed in the course of the program. But what does it all mean for our quest to understand the pathogenesis of human disorders? We as a research group, and uh, this is reflected in the structure of the, the course, we are using classical genetics. Here shown is a genealogical tree, a family tree, of one of the families that we studied to identify sequence variants that are linked to so-called simple disorders, Mendelian disorders. So you are going to learn about linkage analysis. But we are also using modern high throughput genomic techniques. And these techniques tackle more complex disorders. In this case, what I'm showing you is a Manhattan plot, also output of our research group. And this so-called Manhattan plot depicts signals over the entire human genome. The whole human genome is um, represented by the colored stretches of the, on the x-axis. Each of the different colors represents a different chromosome. And the signals, which you see on the y-axis, are regions where variants, sequence variants, are associated, in this case, with one of the many causes of an autoimmune disorder. So this is a complex disorder. One of the most frequent genetic disorders is polycystic kidney disease. And shown here is the way polycystic kidneys can be depicted at different levels of magnification using different imaging or phenotyping methods. You see ultrasound images on the first row, computer tomography images, second row, macroscopic, a macroscopic um, anatomic image on the lower left corner and microscopic hematoxylin eosine stainings in, uh, in the lower right corner. Now, if we want to connect this phenotype with the sequence variant that uh, determines the phenotype, 
we need to understand how the transcription of the genes is dysregulated in disease versus the normal state. And this is the scope of transcriptomics. Transcriptomics being the science of everything related to the second semantide, which is RNA. So moving from genomics to transcriptomics, we are stepping up to the next level of complexity. I mentioned that in the case of the genome, we were dealing with about 20,000 genes. So the order of magnitude is tens of thousands. Now the transcriptome encompasses hundreds of thousands of RNA types. So if we want to push our understanding even further, we need to link the genotype to the phenotype in, uh, in this case, the phenotype is a neurological disorder that we studied. So we need to link genotype to phenotype to modifications in the structure of proteins. And proteins, as I mentioned, are the third class of semantides. Proteomics, which is, uh, which is the science um, studying proteins, has a very ambitious goal. It, uh, its goal is to characterize all proteins in terms of shape, quantity, and localization. And in terms of complexity, this is yet another step up um, on the magnitude scale, from hundreds of thousands of RNA molecules, RNA types, to millions of types of proteins. So we are dealing with increasing complexity and increasing complexity can only be addressed through a shift from classical biology, which relies on single molecule experiments and small scale modeling. So there is this shift from classical biology to systemic biology, the systemic approach in which we deal with large data sets and these data sets are generating from the different type of omics that I have previously mentioned. Our way of dealing with this ever increasing flow of, uh, of data, tsunami of information, if you want, is by using very powerful tools that are automating um, set at least some of the steps of the process. This is data science, and this is why computing science is very important to our approach. This all is reflected in the structure of our program. The program consists of eight teaching modules and one research project. For the full time, the teaching modules are distributed um, four in the first term and four in the second term. And the third term is dedicated to the research project which will lead to the dissertation paper. In each of the eight teaching modules, the theoretical concepts are going to be covered in about 10 sessions. Uh, we call them chapters. And one chapter usually consists of a lecture in the morning, which is followed by a lunch break, and then a practical session or seminar or hands-on in the lab uh, work in the afternoon. As I, uh, as I tried to convince you, the, the course has a strong emphasis on computational methods for the analysis of omics data. And this is why two of the modules are bioinformatics, where you'll learn to use existing tools to solve biological questions. And a very important module is the advanced computational methods module, where you'll actually look under the hood and not only use the tools, but learn how to tinker, to improve them, and maybe even to design some of your own tools to do a little bit of programming. Another important module is the um, ethics module, which is touching upon the important and very, very interesting and spiny ethical, legal, and so societal aspects of multi-omics. This program is meant to give you a wide perspective on biology. So our emphasis is more on concepts than on techniques. 
we try to have an integrative approach, which means we are trying to give you the historical context of the science to answer the question in their uh, in the way they they um, arose in in history, and we are also going to uh, mention the relations with philosophy and even with art. We have a strong, a very strong collaborative approach. You are expected, of course, to learn from us, but we are also hoping to benefit from your ideas and questions. And we strongly encourage you to collaborate among yourselves because science is a collaborative endeavor. The success of our research group has been, grou has been um, built on exchanges between computer scientists and biologists, between clinicians and researchers, between theoretically minded and more experimentally minded individual individuals. And we want you to be immersed in this research culture. You are going to be among us and you are going to learn step by step how we um, tackle interesting research questions. Most of the course will take place on the Royal Free Hospital campus of UCL. And for you to have an idea of what it will look like in terms of the atmosphere of the program, here are um, some pictures of the members of our faculty at work and some of our alumni. And I also have a very fresh photo of this year's participants to the course, which are waving friendly and um, welcoming you to join them. So um, this is where my presentation ends. And thank you for your attention. I'm ready to take any questions if you have some. Thank you, Horia, for this very informative session. That was great. So we will now start our Q&A. So please do add your questions into the Q&A box and I'll be able to read them out. We can get some answers. So I'll just give you guys a few minutes to type them in. So our first question is, are the assessments going to be project-based or exam-based or a mixture of both? Um, assessments are, uh, are indeed a mixture of both. Um, there, are the, there are projects in the proteomics module and in the advanced computing module, and there are also smaller projects. Um, generally, each module is assessed in a um, written exam, so either multiple choice questions or short answers questions, uh, or a written exam. And there is also a presentation component, an oral component, which in the case of uh, advanced computing is a project, as I said. In the case of genomics is a scientific presentation. You'll have five slides and present in front of your peers. In the case of proteomics, this is presenting a scientific poster also in front of your peers. And this is based on the, the project that you went through during the module. So you're, you're putting together the steps that you've learned and the results that you've gotten. So it's, it's literally replicating the, the scientific process. So it, the, the short answer is it's a mix of, of the two. Great, thank you. And our next question is, what would make one's personal statement stand out? Well, what, what we want is to have um, really motivated, interested uh, people who are enthusiastic about learning all these um, very fascinating aspects of, uh, um, of um, biomedical uh, scientists. So if you can convey that enthusiasm, um, this will this will be very well received. I, what I did mention is that this is a, a rather small program, and this is so by design. We want to encourage, an, uh, an, as I said, a collaborative sp uh, spirit. We want you to work as a group. We want us to get to know each other, and uh, and and be friendly and uh, and. Uh, 
this is why we we really want people to to participate with very strong internal motivation. You 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 need to want to be here. Great, thank you. If there are any more questions, guys, just put them in the Q and A. I suppose just a general question as well for you, Horia. What do you find that students like the most about the course? I think what they like about the course is being immersed in a real scientific environment. So they're they're literally in the lab uh, most of the time. Well, during the first terms, they spend a lot of time obviously learning, but they are slowly, slowly eased into being amongst us and working next to researchers and participating in day-to-day -day, um, questions and, and tinkering and, and, and playing and see how the magic happens. So I think that the hands-on aspect is, is very important. And also what I think they enjoy is... Um, the social aspect of this being a, a small group, they um, they collaborate, they learn together, they exchange ideas, and obviously they exchange ideas with the faculty as well. And this is also what we enjoy. I mean, you ask me what what they like, but what we like as um, lecturers and and uh, tutors is also participating in this. It's a win win situation. Okay. So our next question is, do you need strong programming skills for the bioinformatics slash additional computational modules? No, the answer is no. We are trying and I think um, and in our experience also succeeding to to take people from uh, almost being afraid of computers to, well, you're not going to be programmers at the end of this of this of this course that you'll learn enough about algorithms and you'll learn enough about the interface between programming and biology and some of you with a little bit of effort will have uh, made the first steps in towards becoming um, proficient with uh, with python and r but you, you should not be afraid our intention is to start at a very basic level and then build slowly, slowly and um, dissipate the fear of statistics, fear of mathematics, fear of computing. There's no need for that. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question is for international students, how do you assess the bachelor's degree and what are some important prerequisites? Um, the, um, there is an algorithm that um, UCL um, admissions uh, are applying for international well, as well as national students. And I think uh, they have an equivalency table and the, um, the threshold is um, an equivalent of um, the UK 2.1 level. But in some cases, this uh, can be uh, waived okay. if, you, if you build a strong case. And is there any preparation you would suggest prior to commencing the course, such as programming or bioinformatic methods, especially if this has not been your background to date? It never hurts. But uh, as I said, it's not, uh, we, we don't think this is a, a prerequisite. But if you have some prior knowledge, it's it's going to probably be a little bit easier. So if you can play a little bit with, I would suggest R, because it's a, a very powerful and um, with a, an excellent uh, learning slope. And it's very easily applicable to immediate results when um, analyzing data. So this is probably your entry point towards becoming a data sci scientist. And then a little bit more powerful and more versatile will be Python, but also it's a, it's a friendly language. Great. And we've got somebody that's asked a question here. So I'm doing my 
external projects in uni, but I get the certificates and I don't get the certificates until July. Should I still mention them on the personal statement or CV? They said that their professors have mixed opinions regarding this matter. I would I would want to see them in the statement and uh, and the CV. Great, thank you. And we've got Mohammed here who says, thanks for the valuable information. I prepared a proposal um, immunogenetics of toxoplasmosis as a molecular benchmark for early diagnosis, prevention and cure of schizophrenia, but I have no experience in research. How could I know whether it is applicable and could I get a chance to be accepted for the course? Um, well, the first question is indeed, um, uh, if, if uh, students, if applicants uh, pass the in the conditions of uh, UCL admissions. So, but assuming that uh, that the conditions uh, are um, are fulfilled, we encur encourage students to come with research projects and try to to um, make it such that they can follow their own interest, uh, research interests. We'll see if there are at UCL um, labs that would take on projects that the students bring. If there are not such labs at UCL, we even collaborate with other uh, universities. This is this is uh, very flexible. Also, in our um, experience, the majority of uh, students don't uh, come with a with a with a project, and this is fine. We are not expecting, as I said, prior knowledge. And on the contrary, sometimes it's even better to have a better understanding to go through some of the modules to find your way to see what you prefer. Is it being in the lab, is it being in front of the computer? Are you more theoretically inclined data analyst or would you like to generate data? So you need to find yourself. For these students, it's not a problem if they wait until almost the start of the third term to decide what kind of project they, they might want to take on. And there is a list, all research labs within the division of medicine participate and there's going to be a list and students can pick projects from that list and uh, the division of medicine being a, a very vast uh, division with many labs, PIs with very different research interests, it's it's certain that you'll find something that, that you'll find interesting. I'm not worried about that. Great, thank you. So our next question is, what kind of careers can students go into after the course? <laughs> um, well, this is uh, this is a course that is, as I said, supposed to give you a, a broad theoretical understanding. So, what we what we what we think is, it can prepare you for a career as a, a data scientist. It can obviously prepare you for um, academic career. Maybe some of you, and this is the case. We recruited a PhD student from last year's course just now, and. We are trying to recruit uh, another one. So that, that could be the first step for an academic career, or as I said, data scientist, um, either in academia or in industry, consultancy, um, medical related um, um, careers, because more and more medicine becomes genomic medicine and there, there'll be the need for interpreting genomic variants. And uh, in the case of uh, the UK, for instance, Genomic England is um, an, ex an excellent example where science is brought to the bedside and uh, we are trying to help patients directly. So uh, becoming a, a, a professional in, in the field of genomic medicine would, would probably be an, a, a very interesting career. Okay, great. Thank you. And then another question that we have is how many students are on the course? As I said, we by design try to keep the, the the program relatively small, which has the disadvantage that the admission rate is not very high, but has the advantage that we are a small group and you'll have a lot of hands-on time with your tutors. The tutor student ratio is excellent. You'll get to know each other. We'll get to know you and we, it's going to be very easy for us to adapt to your needs, to constantly dialogue. We constantly meet. Students are always around here. We we have meetings. We, we become uh, 
colleagues by the end of the um, of the program and and that's the purpose we we also want to as i said encourage collaboration and create networks and your colleagues are hopefully going to be your collaborators in the future if you join either if you join uh, science or why not even in industry or teaching and uh, um, yes great thank you so just a final call for any more questions um Oh, we have one. So what is the average amount of time a student can spend in the lab within this program? Hmm. I uh, <laughs> I don't have a figure, um, but uh, the least. Um, so out of the four omics modules, the most intensive in the lab module is the proteomics module. So this is where half of the time you'll be in the wet lab. The transcriptomics module also has an, an important wet lab component, so it will be in the lab. The genomics one, less so, because nowadays genomic data is automated. So the uh, practical aspects are going to be mostly pertaining to data analysis, but we'll go to UCL genomics. UCL genomics is the core facility of UCL where the sequencing, high throughput, next generation sequencing takes place. So you will see how um, genomic data is generated. You will have a couple of lectures by Dr. Mark Christensen, who's the director of UCL Genomics, and uh, his lectures are very, very well received. But um, I'd say during the teaching terms, um, you might spend about a third of the time in the lab. Obviously, if students want to spend more time, they're encouraged to do so. I told you we are flexible. We are going to encourage you to be around. And mostly so, we are going to encourage you to be as much as possible in the lab during the third term. So if you take a lab um, based project, we encourage you to start early. You don't need to wait until the start of the third term. You can start visiting the lab earlier, start easing in, knowing the procedures, um, being induced, and so on and so forth. So um, the sky is the limit. If you want to spend a lot of time in the lab, we are, we are thrilled and are going to try to do our best to encourage you to be there. Great, thank you. And our next question, is CRISPR technique something that we could work on? This is part, this would be part of the transcriptomics module. I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Daniela Yanku, who's the lead of the transcriptomics um, module, isn't here to answer directly the question. I know that theoretically, obviously, CRISPR is going to be one of the concepts that is going to be discussed in the, in the transcriptomics module. And uh, I believe that this is something that uh, hypothetically could be worked on. Thank you. Okay. So I believe that's all that we have time for today. So we will leave it there. But thank you all for your comments and questions. And thank you, Horia, for an excellent session. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you very much.